How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is option B, Higher Level Biochemistry, Volume 9, where we look at the biological pigment section of the course. Let's do it. Okay, so Volume 9, Biological Pigments, and this is looking at Part A. We have a chat about colour absorbance, porphyrin compounds, and then we have a look at the haemoglobin and the structure of haemoglobin. Option B, Biochemistry B9, Biological Pigments, has quite a few IB understandings and applications, so make sure you check them out, have a read of them, and make sure that you know what you need to know for this video. So a biological pigment is a colored compound which is produced from metabolism. Now anthocyanins give pansies their purple color and they're a biological pigment. Now all the pigment molecules have absorption bands in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's what gives them the color. Now remember, and we've talked about this in past videos, that the light that we see is the color that is reflected via the pigment. So what's absorbed is the complement of that color. So if we're looking at these pansies, which are kind of like a violet color, then that must mean that it's absorbing yellow. It's reflecting violet and absorbing the yellow region of the spectrum. So remember to check out that color wheel in the data book, especially if they start to give you colors in a question. Now, why do these pigment molecules absorb light? Well, they absorb light due to the nature of their chemical bonds. And in most of the cases, those pigments contain what we describe as a conjugated system. And that consists of alternating double and single carbon to carbon bonds. So cyandin, which is an anthocyanin present in red cabbage, has a number of benzene rings and also a number of alternating carbon to carbon single and double bonds. So we say that it is a highly conjugated system. And because of this alternating double and single bonds, we have these p orbitals that we say are delocalized. These electrons existing in p orbitals, which are delocalized, and they're able to absorb a specific wavelength of light and able to reflect certain wavelengths of light. Now, the take home message here is basically the more conjugated the system, the more the absorbance tends to be in the higher energy spectrum. So the more double carbon to carbon double bonds, the greater the energy that it will absorb. The less the conjugated system, the lower the energy that that system will absorb. But then you've got to remember that what we see is the reflection of that. So even though if it absorbs high energy, that means it's actually going to be like a reddy kind of color. So it's got, we've got that opposite consideration with the color wheel. A porphyrin compound contains the porphyrin ring structure, which is basically four heterocyclic rings containing carbon and nitrogen, which are stuck together with these bridging carbon atoms, holding these four different rings in place. Now these rings, they act as ligands, forming a chelate with a metal ion involving coordinate bonds. Now remember that a chelate is like a cage, so the metal ion gets caught in the middle of the cage and it has those coordinate bonds holding it in place. So a couple of important porphyrin ring compounds include haemoglobin, myoglobin, and chlorophyll, all of which you need to know some information about. Now, chlorophyll contains the magnesium two plus ion. So the chelate is the cage and the, and the iron, the magnesium, sits inside the cage. And it's held by those coordinate bonds from the lone pairs of electrons on the nitrogen atom. And that holds it in place inside the chelate, inside the cage. The heme group, which is common to haemoglobin and myoglobin, contains an Fe2 plus ion. And it's what we call a prosthetic group because it's not part of the peptide chain in the protein. So it's like an additional part of the chain and then the chain holds it in place. Hemoglobin and myoglobin both contain those heme groups within a porphyrin group bound to an iron 2 plus ion. So in hemoglobin, we actually have four heme groups bound within four polypeptide chains. 
So this is a protein that exists with a quaternary structure. So remember we have primary, secondary and quaternary and that whole thing is the shape of the protein. A subunit of hemoglobin containing only one heme group is in a single polypeptide chain is myoglobin. Now hemoglobin and myoglobin are designed to carry oxygen in the blood whereas myoglobin is its job is to store the oxygen in the muscles. Myoglobin and hemoglobin both reversibly bind to oxygen via the Fe2 plus ion. So we represent hemoglobin as Hb and it combined with four oxygen molecules to give us the oxyhemoglobin complex and myoglobin can only bind to one. Now the binding of oxygen in hemoglobin is what we call cooperative, which means it gets easier to bind oxygen the more oxygen we actually have bound to the heme groups, and that's known as a conformational shift. So as we add in one oxygen, then the next oxygen binding to the hemoglobin is actually easier, the oxygen finds it easier to bind. And then if we wanted to bind a third oxygen to the hemoglobin, well it would find it even easier to bind again. So that produces what we call the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which is described as having a sigmoidal shape. And we can see at very low concentrations of oxygen, we have very low saturation of hemoglobin. Whereas as the pressure increases, the saturation increases quite dramatically, and it's not a linear graph, so it's described as a sigmoidal graph. So we can see from this graph about how the effects of hemoglobin's ability to bind to oxygen. At low concentrations, O2 has a low affinity for hemoglobin, or hemoglobin has a low affinity for O2. At higher concentrations of O2, hemoglobin has a high affinity for O2. So that's saying that it's getting easier to bind oxygens the more oxygen that's around. And the more you add oxygen to those heme units, the easier it is to bind. Now there are some factors that affect this bonding. And those factors are temperature, pH, and partial pressure. So how does increasing the temperature change the affinity for hemoglobin? Well, an increase in temperature reduces the affinity of hemoglobin for O2. So at normal body temperature, which is about 37 degrees, we have the standard sigmoidal shape. At an elevated temperature, let's say 40 degrees, we have the curve shifted to the right. Now that means it's easier for hemoglobin to release its oxygen it becomes less affinitive towards the hemoglobin. So the, the, the graph shifts to the right, which means hemoglobin has less affinity for the oxygen. And where would this be important? Well, if you think about exercising, when you exercise, you get hot and your body requires more oxygen. So as your temperature increases, the hemoglobin will release the oxygen into your body and then your body will be able to do the same processes, hopefully at a faster rate if you're exercising hard. If we decrease the pH or increase the partial pressure of CO2, that also reduces the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So the blood pH is about 7.6 and we say that that's at a low PCO2, a partial pressure of CO2. And if we have a lower pH and a high carbon dioxide partial pressure, then we can shift that graph to the right. So that's telling us the same thing as the temperature graph, that the system shifts to the right or the graph shifts to the right, which means that hemoglobin has a less affinity for oxygen if we have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide and if the pH is lower. And the reason for that is that carbon dioxide will dissolve in the blood and that will reduce the affinity for hemoglobin to oxygen. So in general, this hemoglobin oxygen complex, there's a couple of things that we can remember. So if we have our lungs, we have a high oxygen concentration, which will shift the equilibrium to the right. If we have a high partial pressure of oxygen, that's going to shift it to the right as well. To shift it to the right, we would need a low temperature, a higher pH, and then also a low 
carbon dioxide partial pressure. How could we shift this system to the left? Well, in the left, we're looking at the cells in respiring cells where we have a low PO2 concentration, a low partial pressure of oxygen, where we have a higher temperature and where we have a lower pH. Also in our cells, it's very likely that we have a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide because we've got respirating cells producing carbon dioxide. So adult hemoglobin contains four polypeptide chains, two alpha and two beta chains, whereas fetal hemoglobin, or, or babies that are yet to be born, contains two alpha chains and two gamma chains. So they're slightly different in their structure. And this form for fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. Now what does that mean exactly? Well if we take the graph of adult hemoglobin on the right, that is the sigmoidal shape, then fetal hemoglobin will lie to the left of that curve. Because what the fetal hemoglobin needs to do is it needs to be able to extract oxygen from the mother's blood or the paternal blood. So the fact that it lies to the left will allow the baby or the fetus to extract oxygen from its mother's blood. Carbon monoxide CO2 is also known as the silent killer and it has a strong affinity for haemoglobin. The reactions of oxygen and carbon monoxide with haemoglobin are designed as a competing equilibrium. That is that oxygen and carbon monoxide will compete for the same sub substance. In that way, carbon monoxide is a competitive inhibitor to um, hemoglobin. Now we have a K value for the hemoglobin oxygen, which I've called X. And we also have a, a K value for the carbon monoxide hemoglobin. Now the carbon monoxide K value is about 200 times that of the oxygen hemoglobin K value. So that means that if you have any carbon monoxide around and it gets into your blood, then the simply the carbon monoxide just doesn't want to release. It holds on very tightly to the hemoglobin and it kicks out all of the oxygen and it simply won't release the carbon monoxide for you to exhale. So how does carbon monoxide poisoning get treated? Well, the only way you can treat carbon monoxide poisoning is if you can somehow release the carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin. And in that way, we need to shift these two equilibriums. So what they would do is they would feed you pure oxygen or give you pure oxygen. Now what that's going to do is shift the first equation to the right. So we're forming more of the oxygen hemoglobin complex. As that happens, less hemoglobin will be present. So it forces the carbon monoxide equation to shift to the left which releases the carbon monoxide and, and enables more hemoglobin to then react with the oxygen. So our result is that we free up hemoglobin and you start to feel better. Okay, volume nine, some top tips. Check the BART data book for structures, especially the biological ones, and make sure you know about the sigmoidal curve for hemoglobin. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next.